Welcome to Conversations with B'nai B'rith International. I'm CEO Dan Mariasha. Thank you for joining us today. In the 19th century, the science of five wealthy French Jewish families devoted themselves to collecting what they loved, and at their deaths, they bequeathed their art and their beautiful homes to the nation out of love for their country. These families, such as the Commandos and the Rothschilds, also invested their fortunes in France's cultural artifacts even commissioning artists like Auguste Renoir to paint works of art. But these aristocratic families greatly misunderstood the depths of French anti-Semitism. With me to delve into this and more is author and Washington Post contributing columnist James McCauley, whose new book, The House of Fragile Things, Jewish Art Collectors and the Fall of France, shows how an embrace of art and beauty and loyalty was met with hatred and destruction. And with French anti-Semitism once again on the rise, Macaulay's work is even more urgent. He'll be talking with us today about his book and the central role that art and material culture played in the assimilation and identity of French Jews leading up to and during World War II. Macaulay is contributing columnist for the Washington Post after five years as the paper's Paris correspondent. He graduated from Harvard University and holds a PhD in European history from Oxford, where he was a Marshall Scholar. James, thank you for joining me. Really glad to have you with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Well, the first question usually is, and I'm going to ask that first question, what prompted you to write this book? And being in Paris, uh, you could have chosen from a, a broad array of cultural subjects. So tell us about the thought process uh, behind choosing this particular topic. Yeah, no, that's a really that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think I began on this whole path uh, years ago, if I if I'm honest. I um, so when I was at Harvard, I was a student of uh, kind of the legendary historian Patrice Igonnet, who's a specialist of the French Revolution, and. Um, I actually lived upstairs from Professor Igonet and his wife one summer when I was a, a kind of news assistant at the now defunct International Herald Tribune. And um, you know, that, was, that was shortly after the um, appearance in English of the novel Suite Française by Irene Nemirovsky, um, which I'm sure um, many of you will be familiar with. And it, you know, it was a huge sensation. And um, I remember my mom gave that to me to read that year. and I was kind of blown away by it. And so just being in Paris around that time, um, one day um, sort of at dinner, uh, Professor Egonet said, you know, you might, you might want to visit the, the Musée Camondo. I think that you might, you might find something interesting there. And I went and was just blown away by it. And so just to briefly introduce that, it's, um, it's a house museum that is the mansion and art collection of this prominent French Jewish family originally from Constantinople. It's right on the Parc Monceau, um, that sort of area where, you know, if you've read The Hair with Amber Eyes, um, the Efrussi family, you know, a lot of the kind of prominent collectors, Jewish and non-Jewish alike, lived there in the 19th century. And the museum is sort of spellbinding because on the one hand, it's this amazing collection of 18th century art, but also it's kind of um, a time capsule into the sort of final days of this family that emigrated to France, gave so much to France. You know, the, the son died fighting for the country in World War I. And then ultimately, you know, the daughter and the grandchildren and all the, you know, the, the, the final descendants of the family are all murdered in Auschwitz where they were deported. And so it's a kind of chilling place, but a very beautiful place. And I was always sort of struck by that. But then it turned out that, um, the Camondos were intermarried with several other similar families, all of whom also gave and had donated their collections or houses to the state. And so I just became really interested by what that was all about and what it what it meant. Um, and then I would say also, I just, um, you know, I think that the discussion of uh, Jews in France vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the, the, the question of identity and citizenship after the revolution is a very profound one because uh, 
it is in many ways the literal backdrop to the kind of very grandiose conception of universal citizenship that France is so proud of. So it is the actual story against which so much of that was articulated. So I think that it has that useful theoretical aspect of it as well. But anyway, that's a, I'm rambling. That's, that's how I got into the topic originally. Well, you write uh, about the world and the interior lives, uh, you write very movingly, uh, of France's wealthiest and most prominent Jewish families. You mentioned a couple. In the decades preceding and after the Dreyfus Affair, in the Dreyfus Affair, French uh, Jewish army captain, um, uh, wrongly accused of treason, uh, convicted, um, and it sets off uh, a wave of, of anti-Semitism uh, that already was, was present uh, in France, but it just kind of opened it up. Um, tell us a little bit more about these five families, the Commandos, uh, the Fruces, Candever, Reinach, the Rothschild clans. Uh, specifically, you know, where do they come from and, and how did they amass their fortunes in France? Yeah. Um, so essentially, it's um, it's a world that, as I mentioned before, is sort of all intermarried and connected. So, you know, to, to borrow the famous phrase of Chaim Berman, it, it's a cousinhood of sorts. Um, but, you know, I would say um, each of the families has a different story. Um, all our as all, all our immigrants to France um, at some point in the 19th century, although it, it sort of it uh, it does differ in terms of when they came, but ultimately the common thread is that these are outsiders who came to see themselves as insiders, and who came to really become enamored with France and all that it had to offer. Um, and so, you know, the, the Camondos, as I mentioned, came from Constantinople. The uh, the Rhinox came from Germany. The Rothschilds originally came from Germany. Um, the Candelvar um, from on one side uh, from Belgium, and on the, like that. That's the the Anvers, Antwerp. Um, and um, who am I forgetting? Uh, Rothschild. Well, no, I think you have them all. Yeah. Right. Um, no, the Efrosi. Okay. Effrosi. Right. Efrosi originally from um, Odessa, um, as Edmund Duval has written so movingly in his own memoir as well. Um, so you know, it's um, the the origin stories are 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 different, um, as is the relationship to Judaism and Jewishness in each case. Um, the Camondos, for instance, very observant and remain so um, after they arrive in France. The Candonver, not so much. A um, lot of conversion, a lot of assimilation. Um, it really does depend. Um, but, you know, France at that time, I mean, it, it's hard to remember that, but it was, it was the first country in Western Europe to fully emancipate its Jewish population. And so for many of these families, both on the level of sort of professional prospects um, and just sort of, um, I think, the, the prospect of a, of a full and happy life, it was a really, really promising place to be. And that's why so many of them chose France and were so loyal to it. Um, and, you know, I think that there, there, there's... Um, a lot of that's been forgotten today, but it really was at that time um, a destination of choice for so many of these, these families. Now you asked about how did they amass their fortunes. Um, in many cases, it's banking. That's the case for the Rothschilds, of course, for the Camondos who were known as the Rothschilds of the East, and also for the Candonvers, um, the founders of the bank that is today uh, Paribas, although it's gone through many permutations since then. So this is really a world of high finance. And the Rhinox, um, several generations back, back had also been um, a finance family. So it's, it's often that, but also some trade as well. But by the time we get to the people that I am writing, or the, I should say the generation that I'm writing about, many of them are, are um, they're not really involved with the family business as much anymore. They have become, um, they're either members of parliament, they are, um, museum heads, you know, or any number of other kind of cultural or political roles. Like they're, they're totally um, invested in sort of modern France, um, broadly conceived. So it's, um, you know, they, they really came to see themselves as French and really, really invested everything that they had into the country. You learned that uh, their obsession collecting was largely driven by the desire to assimilate into French society. For all their 
loves of the, the French ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity, uh, they had to continually face rampant anti-Semitism in France. Were these families able to see themselves as fully French, or did they still feel in some ways different, notwithstanding their attempts to, to assimilate? You know, that's a that's a super interesting question and one that um, you know, I'm not sure I really know the answer to, because I think it really does depend on the person. Um, I think on the whole, um, I mean, certainly given how the story ends, um, you know, a lot of them, by, by the time um, the, the Nazis had invaded France um, in the summer of 1940, a lot of them didn't feel at risk at all. Um, they didn't feel that they had anything to lose because they were so avowedly um, French, and many of them had left um, uh, had left Judaism behind. Um, but I think um, in the beginning, you know, it's um, it's a really complicated and interesting story because, on the one hand, as you say, the collecting is totally about. Um, you know, projecting a certain image. I mean, that's what collecting is um, uh, on one on one level. I mean, it's it's telling. I think that um, for the most part, these families collected, like like the Kemondo Museum, they collected 18th century um, ancien regime objet d'art, meaning you know, like the the halcyon days of of the French monarchy before the revolution. This sort of it had a kind of conservative political connotation to it. That style. And a nostalgia to it, um, when you know, kind of harkening back to an era when, so to speak, France was truly France. Um, and so that, I mean, that that was the style that had been um, kind of identified as the high watermark of, of French cultural achievement by the likes of the Goncourt brothers, the famous diarists of the fin de siècle, who, by the way, were also um, extremely anti-Semitic and regular guests of all of these families, but bitter critics of them as well. Um, and so, you know, it, I think that it, it, it absolutely was a means of, um, of, of showing through the sort of loving curation of these collections and, and the um, you know, pursuit of these objects with these storied histories, a means of, 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 of I don't know, I don't know, of showing a kind of fidelity to French history and a kind of appreciation of it. But as you say, um, you know, the anti-Semitism of the time was so unbelievably virulent and just it's 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 almost it's almost impossible to overstate the degree to which that was true. I mean, just unbelievable. And when you read the newspapers from that time and and read just sort of the the, the stuff that was published, it's 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 insane. And I think that one thing I try to do in the book, one of the arguments I make is that a lot of the anti-Semit um the anti-Semitic invective of that period was actually in the language of objects and things. It was it was a it was a sort of attack um rendered in material terms. And so these families were um given their prominence were often attacked you know, by name for precisely the, the 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 same reason because they collected objects that belonged to the French past and that in the eyes of their critics like the Goncourt and Edouard Drummond, the sort of um, uh, truly probably most horrible um, of the bunch, um, that you know that the, the, they could never really understand because. In, in the eyes of those critics, you know, Jews were facsimiles of Frenchmen. They were mimetic. They were aesthetically deficient. They couldn't know and understand true beauty. And I, it's just, it's, um, it, it's so interesting to me, like in doing this research, like just how central the question of art and material culture in general was to both the attack on French Jews at that time and the response. And I think that's why um, it's one reason why, at least, um, all of the families left their collections of French art to the state as public museums. It was meant to show, um, you know, in these spaces that had belonged to a Jewish family, collections that were the envy of all and that were these sort of painstaking recreations of the French past. And, you know, we know how the story ends, um, but they didn't, in a sense. Um, because, you know, when the museums opened in the 20s and 30s, um, you know, the, 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 the Nazis hadn't invaded, uh, the Vichy regime hadn't come about, and the Holocaust hadn't happened. So I think they felt um, when, they, when they made these major bequests that perhaps it was a, 
battle, they could still win. And that's what makes so many of these museums like just heartbreaking to visit because there's a kind of doomed optimism to them. Um, it's certainly the case for those, of, I mean, if, if you've seen the Musée Camondo, I mean, it's just, it's inescapable. Let's pause for a moment. We mentioned the Dreyfus Affair, yeah. uh, which, which was clearly uh, made, it, made it an impact on, on their lives going, going forward from the 1890s. But French anti-Semitism did not begin with the Dreyfus Affair. No. Um, and, and maybe we should talk a little about what were the antecedents that, that brought us to that point? Yeah, um, that's a, a very important topic and, and um, a sort of a very long story. But I think in brief, um, I would say as, as everywhere, you know, um, you know anti-Semitism when we when we use the term, I mean, it just it means so many different things at once, right? There are different forms of it, um, and there have been different forms of it at different moments in the past. And so, in France, um, you have, um, I mean, the traditional, age-old um, Christian and specifically Catholic anti-Semitism. I mean, this is still today a kind of culturally Catholic country, but at the time, you know, officially Catholic country, um, and so. All of that um, is present from the very beginning and sort of deeply rooted in the kind of public consciousness. Um, and that's present all throughout the 19th century as well. But then what's super interesting is, is that you know, during the enlightenment against the church, by the way, there's still a very strong um, uh, anti-Semitic strain. Um, and here I think of people like Voltaire who, um, you know, in his hostility to religion um, was extremely hostile to Jews in particular, whom he identified as um, kind of, I don't know, I think his view was uh, to paraphrase that Jews were sort of especially backward because they were so attached to um, a specific tradition, um, a religious tradition that they had, they had inherited for generations and that this was somehow hostile to uh, modernity. Um, and then on top of that, um, you know, France um, is the seat of um, also it's kind of the, the, the place where so much of, I think, what we might call proto-socialist thought emerges. You know, it's, um, you know, people always love to cite the essay uh, by Marx on the Jewish question. But actually, you know, Marx was in Paris in the 1840s studying from sort of French thinkers like uh, Fourier and Proudhon, et cetera. And they, um, uh, th these sort of mid 19th century French thinkers similarly identified Jews as the um, kind of epitome of capitalist greed. And so there's that strain of anti-Semitism as well. So you have all of them um, here. And then as the 19th century goes on and the pogroms in Eastern Europe um, in the later 19th century cause a huge um, migrant flow um, into Western Europe, but especially into France for all the reasons I mentioned before about it being a relatively tolerant country uh, for, for immigrants at that time. I mean, I use the word relatively um, with emphasis. Um, it, you have this kind of um, nativist anti-Semitism. So like the likes of uh, Maurice Baez who, um, and Charles Maurras, um, who had this conception of um, like, uh, Baez's most famous novel is called Les Deracinés, the, the, up, the, the, the deracinated, the uprooted. And it's about um, an organic conception of the soil, right? And certain people, have roots in the soil and others do not. And those that do not are the Jews who in this conception are always sort of um, outside um, the, the body politic, um, no matter what they try and do. So um, by the time we get to the, the, the time of my story, which is the sort of the Dreyfus era to Vichy, it's kind of all of them at once because it's never um, the case that any of them wins out. They're sort of all of these strains at the same time. And um, obviously it reaches a boiling point, but um, it's, a, it's a quite complicated and interwoven uh, story. When you talk about the, the 20s and the 30s before uh, Hitler came to power, or at least before the Nazis came to France, yes. uh, was there any, any indication by, by any of the families in, in, in letters uh, or anything that you found, because this is such a well-researched book, uh, of, of, of impending doom, 
I mean, did they, did they sense that something is happening here, particularly as we move closer and closer to 1940? Did, did any of that crop up in, in, in what you've uh, researched? Um, you know, I'm sure that there are, um, this is the problem with, with research like this. There's always stuff that you just don't know. Um, and at the end of the day, what's so frustrating and I think satisfying is that there are question marks that will always remain that you can never answer. So, um, you know, I, I can't say for sure that there wasn't concern, but what I can say is that in the documents that I did find, and I did find a lot very little, much more than you would think. And that is interesting as well, because it suggests that for this sort of rarefied circle of, of families, and it was truly rarefied. I mean, it's, it's, it, they were unbelievably elite and extremely insulated by their wealth for a while. It really seems as though they didn't think that um, the worst could happen, at least to them. Um, and what was the most surprising to me, um, I mean, it's just there, there are, when you do this kind of work, there are some amazing moments that happen, um, which don't happen often, but sometimes you get lucky and you find, you know, one document or one letter or just some like tiny little piece of paper that changes absolutely everything you thought you knew. Um, and that happened to me with the, um, the um, how to say, the, the daughter of the Camondo family, the kind of last surviving member of the of the family who um, was deported I uh, was arrested here in Paris uh, where I'm where I'm coming to from today in December of 1942 and then sent to the Drancy internment camp outside of the city uh, for about uh, over a year um, and Drancy for those of you who don't know it's on the way to the Charles de Gaulle airport like you'll drive through it it's kind of um, a chilling little thing you see on the side of the road. And then um, she was sent to Auschwitz where she was murdered with her husband and children. But I'm rambling. The, the point being, I, I met this old man um, through um, a kind of complicated chain of connections who, whose mother had been a good friend of Beatrice de Camondo in childhood. And she um, and, and they had they had exchanged letters, et cetera, et cetera. And he um, he lives in the, the Paris suburbs in a kind of um, ordinary apartment. Um, he he had me over for coffee one day, and he handed me these these letters that she wrote to his mother. And one of them was uh, it's dated, I believe, September 5, 1942. So three months to the day before Beatrice was arrested. And like just for some historical context. By September 1942, um, there had already been the infamous Valdiv roundup of Parisian Jews. Um, the Yellow Star had already been a requirement um, uh, for, for, for Jews to wear. Um, the the anti-Jewish laws imposed by the Vichy government had been in place for years. So, I mean, it it's impossible, I mean, to, to think that, um, uh, you wouldn't have been aware of, of the sort of horrors that were going on. And yet, um, in September 1942, Beatrice de Camondo, who, um, it's unclear when she had, when she had converted to Catholicism exactly and when she had ceased to think of herself as Jewish, um, at least um, in a religious way. Um, but you know, by then she had converted to Catholicism and she didn't really... Um, she didn't, she didn't think anything could happen to her. And, and there's a phrase in the letter where she says, I mean, she's, she's aware that, that bad things are happening, that the yellow star is, is required. She mentions that, but there's an amazing line where she says, um, and yet God and the Virgin will protect me still. Um, she really seems to have believed that no matter what happened, she would have been, she would have been saved. And of course they weren't. Um, but it just goes to show that I think it's somehow indicative of the mindset of so many in that milieu, um, even the ones that didn't convert necessarily because they had given so much to France. I mean, so many of their, their sons and brothers had died fighting for World War I, as in fact did Beatrice's brother. Um, you know, her father had given a huge uh, bequest to the state, so had many others, and they just thought that that would be enough, but it all turned out to be for nothing. And that, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, um, I don't know, I think for me personally, one of the, um, the challenges of this uh, project has been um, 
trying to escape the biases and the certainties of hindsight, which you know are inescapable for, for us. You know, we we are coming from a place after the Holocaust where, again, as I said before, you know, we know the ending of the story in a way that they didn't. Um, but it's um, it's been it's been really it's been really challenging because you know you you walk into the the Camondo Museum or you read this letter that she wrote and you think, gosh, you know how tragic they didn't understand their times, and what's I think the most haunting takeaway for me in all of this is that nobody ever does, including us, and it's um, it really it's a it's a really kind of um, unsettling thing to take away. But um, I don't know, I, I was really struck by that. No, it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> you write about the, the service in World War One, and this is true. It's true in a number of other a number of other countries. Um, I know in France, for example, I think it's the La Victoire synagogue, which has this yes. listing of the soldiers uh, who served uh, in World War One, and it's true in Germany as well. I mean, I yep. remember <laughs> visiting Dresden uh, shortly after uh, the unification of Germany and seeing a monument listing the German Jewish soldiers uh, who served from Dresden <clears throat> in Romania, the same thing. And it was only uh, a matter of, of 20 years, more or less, 20 years between their profession of loyalty to their country by serving. And World War I, of course, was a, a terribly bloody war. Um, and then the world comes down on them uh, a short, short time later. Um, Talk about the art for a second, because it's important as it relates to the story. The collections that these five families amassed were focused on different periods and, and types of art. You've mentioned uh, some of it. Uh, why did some of the collectors focus on the fine and decorative arts that was created before the French Revolution, do you think? And how did this aesthetic uh, fit into their perception of their place uh, in their adopted country? Um. You know, I think that um, as we started to talk about a few minutes ago, um, it was just the most sort of um, in vogue style for elites at that time. And so as um, as um, upwardly mobile, wealthy immigrants seeking to make um, a name for themselves and to establish themselves in the sort of super exclusive um, uh Quarters of Paris, um, it's kind of a natural that they would have chosen the same style as so many of their um, their counterparts. Um, I think it's interesting to me because, um, you know, for instance, uh, it was the French Revolution um, that emancipated the Jews and that opened so many doors for future successes in France. Um, but when these families come to France, they collect the style that, in fact, does not correspond to the French Revolution in that period, but in fact predates it. Um, when, um, when you know, b before anything had been done to emancipate the Jews, and and in fact, when there was so much hostility to them. Um, so that's I don't know. That's um, I don't really have an answer to that, but it, it is an interesting question. Um, but I think it was it was really a means of. Um, assimilation in a sense. Um, so that style, the Ancien Regime, kind of um, the Louis XV, Louis XVI, um, that moment, um, it had been identified by the likes of the Goncourt brothers and Drummond as the sort of uh, the essence of the, the French genius. And so as, um, you know, I, I think these families were sort of attracted to it for that reason. Um, it's interesting. I mean, you asked about why do some collect decorative uh, furniture and others paintings, et cetera. You know, I think um, we talked a little bit about, you know, the social side of collecting, um, meaning the, the public aspect of it. You know, it's about projecting an image. You want people to see what you have amassed and um, how well you have uh, curated this environment. And then ultimately, when you leave it to the state, you want people to come and see what a loyal custodian you were of all of this history um, and how generous you are. But there's also, um, you know, very importantly, there's a, there's a psychological element to collecting as well. Um, something that's kind of unknowable about what attracts people to objects. And that's certainly true with these collectors. You know, um, it's, uh, there's an amazing essay by Walter Benjamin, who himself was a collector of books that gets at some of this psychology, that it's about um, 
uh, kind of stopping what Benjamin calls dispersion, um, or in another way, um, kind of creating order out of the chaos of everyday life. And I think that for so many of these families who were, yes, very wealthy and yes, very successful, but um, also just deeply vulnerable as Jews in France in this sort of anti-Semitic moment, um, collection and the the kind of the worlds they created on the inside of their of their houses were these kind of solaces or refuges, and um, there's that aspect of it too. And they, they have these kind of um, emotional connections with some of the objects. Like just to give you an example, um, Moise de Camondo, the the patriarch of the family that that amassed the amazing collection that is today the museum. Um, he, he had all of these items that were the envy of so many museum directors, and he was constantly being asked to, you know, lend pieces to shows here and there, um, either in Paris or even in the Met in New York. And every single time he said no. Um, and the most telling one was right before his death. Um, there was a portrait of, by Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun in his office and somebody, I think it was from the Met actually in New York, asked him if he would send it. And he said, no, it's the only thing I have left. And in my office, I would be heartbroken to let it to let it go. Um, and it just it 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 suggests sort of what what all of that was really about on the inside. So yes, I mean it, it was meant to be admired by people one day, but really it had a kind of um, in a sense it was you know there's that amazing line from from Marx, all that is solid um, melts into air. And in a sense, the collections were all that was solid in their lives when everything else was unpredictable, when the war, the, the First World War had claimed so many of their sons and brothers, and when you had these kind of um, rabid anti-Semites um, kind of rising to power all over the place. I, I just, I really get the sense that it was about um, kind of inner peace, however they could find it. So it wasn't really acquiring for the sake of acquiring. I mean, they attached; they were attached to to this to this art. Did any of the families patronize the contemporary artists? Yes. Um, so um, one of the Camondos, who is not a huge character in my book, but who is also very interesting, is Moise's cousin Isaac de Camondo, who was an early collector of um, uh, impressionist art and and sort of more modern stuff. Um, and then when he died in 1911, he left everything to the Louvre. And there was a whole special Camondo wing for his collection because it was just so amazing. And today, um, uh, given the sort of uh, time uh, limits of the museum, it's now mostly in the Orsay across the river. But yes, um, most were kind of obsessed with the Ancien Regime, Louis Kahn's, Louis says style, but a few were invested in modernist stuff too. Explain to us, we're always interested in this part of it, a little bit about the way the heads of families dealt with their children. And in turn, how did their children feel about them? Um, how, how do you mean in terms of dealt with Well, children? in terms of how, how do they relate to the, you know, that we often see um, in families like this, the children sometimes will stay in family business um, and will also um, stay not only in the business of, of the business, but also in for example, art collection. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as we move through the generations here, how did that transpire? Uh, and, and how did the, the children actually feel about their parents? Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's interesting because there are, there are two factors. There's on the one hand, as you say, there's the generational divide, but also the gender divide. And that's something I found super interesting in, um, kind of combing through a lot of the letters and diaries and other records that I found is that, um, so like, you know, many, uh, I think families, not just in France, but you know, this sort of 19th century, very uh, bourgeois collecting thing, broadly conceived. I mean, it, it can be really oppressive. I mean, just um, some of the houses, I mean, it's just unbelievable. Um, quantities of objects and precious pieces of art all over the place. And it's this kind of, um, it's, it, it's the sign of a, of a very traditional ordered bourgeois house that has a specific gender role attached to it. And there's been lots written um, about the way in which collecting is often a male um, activity, sort of ordering the house and ordering the family. Um, there, there's a sort of connection there. And, you know, um, 
ordering, like for instance, Renoir uh, to do portraits of your daughters and, and, and your wife as the Cannes d'Anvers family did, I mean, it sort of suggests that women were meant to, to play a certain role in this whole, this whole world. And what's so interesting is that so many of the women in the subsequent generations rebelled. They divorced multiple times. They became um, uh, saloniers, kind of leading lives of their own design. And in some cases, they left the um, uh, traditional um, uh, kind of Jewish uh, religious upbringing that they had had, either for kind of more secular um, upbringing or more, more secular family settings, or just leaving Judaism entirely. So I think that um, mostly for the women in the milieu, I mean, it was just that time though, like when you have the origins of the suffrage movement, not so much in France at the time, but a little bit. And um, there was a revolt against the sort of traditional family structure, which manifested itself in a lot of ways. Um, for the sons, um, a lot of them remained in the family business, as you say, which was still banking nominally conceived. Um, but others sort of drifted away. And there was a lot of intermarriage, which was frowned upon by the generation of the collectors, but sort of embraced by their sons and daughters. So a, a good example of that is Nisim de Camondo, who died in World War I, the son of the great collector and the brother of the woman who was murdered in Auschwitz. He, uh, he never converted, but he was um, about to marry, um, had he survived the war, um, this sort of Catholic nurse that he fell in love with who treated him for appendicitis. And they had this longstanding affair that he never told his father about. Um, and that, that was all sort of disclosed to his dad after the war and it was this whole thing. Um, but it, it just shows that um, to get back to the point of, of collecting and control, I, I, I try to argue in the book that for a lot of that sort of first generation or, or kind of patriarch generation, collecting was a means of also sort of exerting control um, that they were conscious of losing even in their own households, on their own families. And so there's a lot of sort of psychological, personal elements of that as well. But it's a good question. On the whole, I mean, it, it does depend family by family, but you do see people, um, men and women alike, leaving in the younger generation, sort of leaving the traditional path, whether that's for the men working in the bank and for the women sort of being dutiful wives. Um, there was a lot of um, pushback against those traditional roles. Well, the final part of your book explores the, the tragic uh, denouement of these families. Uh, what happened to them and why? You've talked about Beatrice de Camondo. Um, were they deluded into thinking, as you talked about in that letter, that they were somehow different from other Jews? Or was it their belief that France, the France that they loved, could never betray its own belief in, in liberty, equality, and, and fraternity? Um, what, what, what's happened to uh, the families? Are there, are there survivors? Where are they today? Yeah. Um... That's, it's a really, um, it's a sort of horrible end of the story. Um, I, uh, my sense is that they, as a whole, um, and again, it's, it's difficult to speak for a whole group of people, um, especially some that only have a few traces that survive. Um, but my sense from reading everything I could find about all of them is that they really did not think that um, such a horrible fate could befall um, people like themselves who had given so much to the country in various ways, whether that was family sacrifice or these major donations, or um, just on a purely practical level. I mean, they, I think many of them thought that if they had not themselves been practicing uh, Jews for, for decades, that it was this, this Nazi perse persecution of Jews would somehow not apply to them. So I think they they failed to understand in some cases the racial element of the Nazi um, uh, um, assault, um, so to speak. Um, but I think, as you say, it, it really was also just this belief in France as a as a place that had always been good to them and that had given them so much and that they had given so much to that it was it was sort of unthinkable. Um, and you know, um, I think. 
it, it's, um, again, as I said earlier, it's easy for us to, to sit here now and think about how, um, how strange that that belief sounds. Um, but at the time, I mean, it, none of the, there was no precedent for any of this. It was, it was beyond the realm of comprehension what was going to happen. So um, I, I guess I, I understand in that sense. Um, but um, basically what happens is eventually they do have to go into hiding. Um, and um, they do that in, uh, depending on the families in a, a variety of different ways. Um, but they are on the whole all hunted down um, and then all briefly reunited in that internment camp I mentioned that's very near the Paris airport today, the Drancy camp, um, where this sort of world of the collectors and their descendants reconstitutes briefly. And then they are um, deported to Auschwitz um, in, in many cases where they are, they are all murdered. Um, and some members of the families did survive. But I think what's important to note is that those that did survive essentially left France behind. It was a sort of rupture. Um, so the descendants today live in the UK or live in Switzerland or Argentina or Canada or, or New York. Um, and they do, I think, you know, in some cases, maybe um, kind of future, future generations have, have come back. But I mean, that um, closeness to France and to the national project is over. Um, that kind of 19th century French Jewish embrace, um, that seems to be, uh, at least as it was, as it was understood at the time, seems to be a, a relic of, of, of history. And, um, it, it really does seem to be a definitive, um, rupture. Well, final question. Tell us a little bit about Renoir's portrait, uh, The Little Irene which for you seems to be the picture that, that perfectly symbolizes the narrative of people who, whose material wealth was immense and yet ultimately could not save them from their fate. Yeah. Um, the portrait has this, this is an unbelievably dramatic story. So um, uh, I imagine many of you will know the portrait. It's the sort of beautiful profile depiction of a young girl with red hair. Um, it features in uh, the famous Godard movie, Breathless, um, and it's on tote bags and museum gift shops around the world. You've definitely seen this painting. Um, it, it was, so it, it depicts um, a, a woman who's called Irene Cain d'Anver, daughter of the Cain d'Anver family that I write about in the book. And um, it belonged to Irene Cain d'Anver's daughter, who was Beatrice de Camondeau that I mentioned. Um, it was hanging in Beatrice's apartment um, in neuilly sur seine It actually, the apartment looks out over the Louis Vuitton Foundation, the art museum, for, for those of you who have seen that. It's a very posh, beautiful place. Um, it was it was initially taken to the Chateau de Ch I mean, after the Nazis invaded, the portrait was taken for safekeeping with a lot of other valuable works of art before the Nazis arrived to the Chateau Chambord in the Loire Valley. And it was there that the Nazi art task force, the infamous ERR, got, got, got its hands on the, the portrait, among many other works. And it, be, it then becomes property of Hermann Goering, very briefly. Um, and it hangs in one of his country houses. And then um, eventually, it, um, it, he trades it for something else. We think a Florentine Tondo, although there's some speculation about that. Um, and it, it um, it kind of falls away for a while and Beatrice and her family are all deported to Auschwitz and they're all murdered and they never see the portrait again. But then um, after the war, some of the stolen art was relocated, um, thankfully, and brought back to Paris where it was exhibited in a kind of uh, impromptu show in 1945 designed to return as much of it as possible to any survivors there might still be. And Irene Candonver, um, who uh, is the subject of the portrait, survived the war um, somehow. We don't know exactly how, um, but she survived and she claimed it. Um, and she said that this is my painting. You know, it's me when I was a little girl, and I should have it back. Um, even though you know she and Beatrice um, appear to have been somewhat estranged. Um, Irene had left, she had converted to Catholicism, had abandoned her kids when they were very little. Um, it was this whole kind of scandal. So we don't really know the relationship between mother and daughter, but the mother and the subject of the portrait got the painting back. 
And um, what she did with it in, almost um, immediately after that was sell it through an intermediary to um, this Nazi arms dealer or this, this, this man who had um, sold arms to the Nazis um, named Emil Burla, um, who had also profited immensely from the black market and bought a lot of um, uh, stolen works of art from Jewish families like uh, Paul Rosenberg, the famous dealer, um, Burla was forced to give um, many things back, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of person. Um, so Irene Kandover sells it, the portrait of Irene and the property of her daughter who was murdered by the Nazis to a Nazi arms dealer. And today the portrait remains in his collection in Zurich. And it's, um, it's really unfortunate because it was a legal sale. Um, so there's no restitution claim that can be made. It belongs to the Burla collection and it was legally acquired by them. And La Petite Irene, this famous and beautiful painting, which has this sort of horrible wartime past, um, will be there. And um, it's just, um, it's really tragic that and to me that Beatrice de Camondo and her family have kind of been written out of the story of the painting. Um, and I don't know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's quite a terrible end to the story. Well, the book is The House of Fragile Things, Jewish Art Collectors and the Fall of France by Washington Post contributing columnist James McCauley and is available in store or online wherever you purchase books. A truly fascinating and a timely read. James, thank you for joining me from Paris uh, and talking with us about your new book, uh, about the heartbreaking history of French art collectors uh, from the fin de siècle uh, through World War II. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks again to James McCauley for being with us today and speaking with us about his book, The House of Fragile Things. And thank you for checking out this conversation with B'nai B'rith. If you enjoyed this discussion, make sure you never miss a program by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel liking us on Facebook, and following us on Twitter. Be sure to visit our website, thenebrith.org, to learn more about our important work. See you again soon.